Good evening, class. Um, I have the chapter on Hegel, um, which is called Hegel and the Restoration of Optimism. This is chapter 10, and it's a very difficult chapter, so I hope you'll stick with me on this. So Hegel, who lived from 1770 to 1831, was a post-Kantian idealist who envisioned a systematic philosophical system that focuses upon a teleological account of history and devises a thesis, synthesis, antithesis, dialectic for all relations. Additionally, Hegel envisioned his system and the absolute spirit functioning as a sort of universal mind that further articulates through time and history. While Hegel is not explicitly Christian, his work has laid a firm foundation for Christian theology, and he also represented a critical shift in philosophical thought that has influenced philosophers in one way or another ever since. So I wanted to quickly share this diagram with you that explains sort of this radical shift from Kant to Hegel. And so as you can see in Kant, um, God and man are extremely separate. Uh, when we get to Hegel, there begins to be some interplay. There's a continuity between the divine and creation that I will uh, illustrate in this video. So what is history? This is a really important question when you're considering Hegel. So for Hegel, history is the progressive self-unfolding and self-realization of the absolute. Now, because Christianity is concerned with history and telos, there is an affinity between Christianity and Hegel. Hegel posits that an absolute with a dialectical unity in which it as spirit or geist becomes other than itself in history or time, and then rises above the opposition between itself and the other by knowing itself in the other and by developing itself in the other as well. The final absolute dialectical unity consists in the act of knowing and absolute knowledge in which opposition is included within the absolute spirit in its knowing and overcoming of the other. At the bottom is the conviction that reality is a continuum so that nothing is ever utterly separate. Otherwise, there would never be a hope of bridging the gap between things or connecting things, specifically in regard to subject and object connection. Again, a continuum is critical. Instead of reality being comprised of discrete, distinct particulars a la Kant, Hegel views reality as internally connected and relations are part of identity. Once more, reality is a continuum rather than unique, distinct things or events. So Hegel strikes out to conceive of logic in a new way, different from Kant. Reality must be presented concretely and cannot be represented by abstractions of logic that does not seem to operate on a yes-no binary. In order to accommodate the new logic, dialectics must come into play, including what something is or not is. How it is different and the like must be included in the expression. In order to say that something is, one must consider its relations to everything else. So similarly, Hegel's concreteness is to conceive of a particular in its relations to other things and ideally in relation to all else. Equally important is the consideration of time. Reality is a continuum both spatially and temporally. This goes back to Hegel's assertion that the historical process unfolding is the ultimate reality, the absolute, which is realizing itself. Reality is the process of becoming fuller and more articulated. Hegel views the entire cosmos and its history as the absolute coming into greater actualization and greater articulation and multiplicity in an orderly, rationally understandable way. So different from Plotinus, Hegel posits that as we get more and more concrete articulation in time and space in the course of history, we also get a greater and greater realization of the absolute itself. So again, this is moving away from uh, the Sto Stoics transcendent one and Aristotle's unmoved mover. And so I really like this um, depiction because it short, sort of uh, leans into that, um, you know, time becomes more articulated and more understandable um, as history proceeds. I wanna quickly show this illustration because I think it makes a good point. Um, in considering how Hegel views history, we need to take his dialectics into consideration. And so this means that together, the antithesis and thesis produce the synthesis. And this is a continual process that is happening through time. This is another uh, really good illustration that shows you exactly how the Hegelian dialectic works. So as you can see, when the thesis and antithesis come together, they create a uh, synthesis, which is a new thesis, which then goes on to meet another antithesis to create a new synthesis. Hegel's philosophical system has three major aspects. This is logic, nature, and spirit. Logic treats and relates all concepts under the notion of absolute idea. 
Logic is taken as a whole and is concretely realized and present in the unfolding reality of nature. Nature involves the study of the rise and development of specialized disciplines that investigate nature and study the relations between the disciplines. Spirit includes logic in nature, deepening and enriching the accounts found in each of them. Spirit includes the layers of our own consciousness and the relations to what we are not as well. This is important in regard to spirit. The relations of spirit show how subject and object, which are not identical, have an affinity for one another, which is progressively realized. Finite spirits and infinite spirit have an implicit unity and difference that is progressively becoming explicit. So we can imagine panentheism here. There's immense detail in Hegel's system because it involves all relations between all spirits, the state, culture, religion, various achievements, etc. Since all is connected and all exhibits a progressive manifestation of the absolute, what we find is that logic, nature, and history are like the manifestation of a mind unfolding and realizing itself. Logic, nature, and history exhibit an orderly progression which is similar to our own thinking, and they exhibit relations within themselves and to each other that are like the movement of a mind. Nature has an inner teleological movement and human beings are at home here with the telos. Nature and history have a progressive unfolding and realization of this inner telos, of which essentially everything, including our own self-realization, is a part of. So telos is inherent in reality itself. And so I just wanted to share this um, really cool graph, diagram, illustration, whatever you want to call it, um, that illustrates this logic, spirit, and nature um, aspect of Hegel's philosophical system. And this is just another way of imagining sort of the complexity of this philosophical system. So if we think of Hegel's system as having two ends, one is finite mind and the other is absolute mind. I'm going to focus on the absolute mind in relation to Christianity or absolute spirit here. For Hegel, the highest form of religion is Christianity and all things are manifestations of the absolute mind. So with that, we are going to now shift and look at sort of the theological implications of Hegel's philosophical system, specifically through reconciliation and the God human. The problem in religion and also philosophy and personal life is reconciliation. Usually we think of reconciliation as a transaction between the holy and profane, but for Hegel it is that God is infinite and creatures finite. This is a rift which must be healed. So as you can see here, we're looking at the thesis, antithesis, and th synthesis um, illustration once more. However, there's an important critical key here in this conversation, which is that of reconciliation. So synthesis represents reconciliation. Human beings are in a state of evil because they are finite. Infinitude itself is evil. Nature is not evil because nature cannot directly fellowship with God the way that human beings can. It is this potential for fellowship with God which makes humanity evil. And humans stay in this evil state until the destiny of fellowship with God is fulfilled. For Hegel, whatever is real must become concrete and manifest in this world. So to be real, God must become manifest, must become revealed, and must become noble. God has absolute freedom, and to make this concrete, God grants independent existence to something that is not divinity. The other thing is the world, or creation, or the universe, etc., which expresses the absolute freedom that is God. It is the realization of God's own nature, and the world becomes God's other, God's creation. This means God must reconcile this other to the divine. It must be restored in unity. So this is reconciliation once more. To follow this thought, finitude itself is only evil because it contrasts to the telos of God's process. It must be united to the infinite. Very obviously, this relates to humanity's fallen state. The fall is a necessary stage in the life of God and humanity's salvation. Without finitude, God's richness and diversity remains unrealized. God remains potential, not actual. Through the fall, God's richness becomes actual. All separate existence being gathered together into a single unity is this reconciliation. Here, human beings become conscious to their unity with the divine or the infinite. This is God realizing divine selfhood in the concrete. This is the reconciliation of the finite and infinite. But even now in our state, there's still a continuity between us and God that must be remembered. This is representative of the ontological ground of the reconciling work performed explicitly by Christ. For Hegel, the incarnation is a necessary event in the life of God. It had to happen because divine and human natures are not alien or dissimilar. Whatever is true of God's nature must be concrete in the world of time and space and history as well. 
The truth that the infinite and finite are identical requires an instance of a God human, a concrete instance of the union of the infinite and finite natures. The incarnation shows that finite nature is compatible with divine nature. It shows that reconciliation between the two is in fact possible. As God human, Christ is the major step in the historical process whereby opposition between infinite and finite spirit is being overcome. Hegel's endorsement of the incarnation reversed a philosophical trend departing from enlightenment thinkers. So as we saw last week, um, this, this belief that Christ is only an uh, enlightened teacher or moral guide. In Christ, we see the divine identifying itself with the human to the fullest extent by living a human life. His death shows identification with humanity to the fullest degree. Death is the crucial mark of humanity and the finite. Christ endures death to show the total identification of the divine with the human. The incarnation in Christ's life and death bring out the full extent of the bond and essential unity of the infinite and finite. So Christ's death has another aspect which becomes apparent through the resurrection. And that is that the resurrection shows that the finite is destroyed in the death of the God human. All the natural aspirations and personal ends of the individual existing in independence for himself are given up. Selfish goals are destroyed and taken up into the higher truth about ourselves. Divinity or the infinite are shown to be our true nature. Christ dies for all and all die in Christ. When these events are viewed in light of objective truth, they are seen as moments in the divine life. These moments were not just an accident of history, but were deliberate moments as a realization of parts of God's nature. These historical events have ontological importance. So we're going to shift here and look at um, individuals, philosophers that came after Hegel and are still building upon or critiquing Hegelian thought. It's important to note that what drove Kierkegaard and Karl Barth crazy about Hegel is that he concedes that the incarnation did not uniquely create the possibility for reconciliation because God and humanity have an underlying unity. For both men, Bart and Kierkegaard, God is wholly other and different, and reconciliation is only possible through God's grace alone. For Kierkegaard, to stand in relation to God was to oppose standing in relation to the world, so wholly other. Kierkegaard believed that should Hegel um, have believed his philosophy to be only a thought experiment, not reality, he could have been the greatest thinker of all time. Kierkegaard writes as such in his work, Fear and Trembling. The paradox of faith is this, that the individual is higher than the universal, that the un individual determines his relation to the universal by his relation to the absolute, not his relation to the absolute by his relation to the universal. So that's not in the chapter, but I thought it was important context for you. This chapter also highlights further breaks from Hegel's ideology or building upon his ideology in cases like D.F. Strauss, Feuerbach, and even Karl Marx via his dialectical materialism, along with a split in the field between right-wing and left-wing Hegelianism. So you can imagine this as left-wing and, left and right-wing uh, politics today. So left-wing uh, Hegelians saw this more in a, a liberal, um, both religiously and politically sense, and right-wing were much more conservative. And this is not necessarily in the chapter, but I thought it was really interesting context, especially as we've been making this, these shifts over the past couple of weeks um, from sort of this platonic um, substantial essence system of, of uh, conceptualizing God to um, almost a, an empty or void essence um, understanding of the absolute, which was um, envisioned by Hegel and also carried forward uh, in, in more modern times by Heidegger. And so I'll end with this picture of Slava Zizek, who is a very well-known um, left-wing Hegelian of our time. Um, he's written extensively about sort of this um, uh, abyss core of uh, Christianity, which is very interesting. Um, and so I wanted to share him as an example that we are still working with the Hegelian philosophical structure to this day. Um, and I also wanted to share um, that philosophers, possibly like Alexander Dugan, are a good example of a right-wing Hegelian or even an anti-Hegelian. Uh, so just a bit to think about as we move forward in this class. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing about Hegel.